Welcome everyone to the Cyverse Focus Forum webinar. Today's webinar is on leveraging Cyverse for large-scale spatial data analysis presented by Tyson Swetnam. Thanks for joining us and thanks for registering. I'm Tina Lee. I'm a Cyverse's user engagement officer and I'll be turning over the webinar real shortly, but I just want to do one little bit of housekeeping. First, please, if everybody can uh, turn on the chat. Um, as you can see, we have the webinar setting, so you can't speak, but if you type in your questions there, um, I'll make sure that Tyson can read them and answer them during the webinar if that's appropriate. Otherwise, we'll save questions till the end. Today's presentation is about 50 minutes with 10 minutes at the end for questions. Um, all the materials that are presented today, including the video, will be posted to the wiki page that's at the top of the chat. And um, we'll also send you a survey at the end of today to get your feedback. I really would appreciate any feedback you have about how to improve the webinar or suggestions for other topics. So without further ado, here's Tyson. All right, thank you, Tina. Um, just so everyone can see right now, I'm, I'm going to be running a presentation from GitHub. You can see a link here to the Cyverse-GIS focus forum. And if you click on this link, you'll be able to replay this this entire presentation. And I also have some example scripts, which I've installed and, and how to get started using some of these Cyverse tools. But uh, how does that look, Tina? Are we full screen, ready to go? Ready to go. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, thank you um, for attending this focus forum on using GIS and Cyverse. Uh, this is a new venue for Cyverse, and uh, it's exciting to, to see Cyverse grow in this way. So today I'm going to be talking about leveraging Cyverse for large-scale spatial data analyses. I have my information at the lead of the presentation. Uh, roadmap. So we'll talk a little bit about the emergence of data science and what we call the research object. I'm going to give some data scientist workbench examples, popular software that are used by data scientists. I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction to Cyverse. Uh, Cyverse is very broad and there's a lot of tools that can be used for spatial analysis. And this is just kind of a taste of all the different things that you can do using Cyverse. I'll, I'll talk a lot about the use of containerization and, and how it's useful when working on cloud and HPC and, and remote systems like Cyverse. And finally, I'll, I'll end with uh, several GIS demos. Uh, hopefully everything goes smoothly and you guys can see what it is you can do. Uh, the, the different skill levels that I'm, I'm pitching in this presentation this is, this is based on uh, new users. So you, you've got people that are looking to work in graphic user interfaces, um, and they're, they prefer to work in an integrated development environment like an IDE. And, and they're probably just learning how to do some spatial analysis for the first time. So you can be a student and begin using Cyrus in this way. There are experienced users who are probably interested in scaling their workflows beyond their existing systems. So they do a lot of work on laptops or on desktops, and they want to move into the cloud. Uh, you're probably also running into a place where you have a lot of data that you need to move around networks, and that's where Cyverse can really help. And then last, uh, for the power users, who a lot of this will be rudimentary, um, but you have an interest in, in integrating very large data sets, uh, moving them around um, from remote platform to remote platform, and, and presenting probably a development API for users to interface with. So what does large-scale data really mean? You know, we hear about big data all the time, and we're all faced with this problem that there are always more data. There's an uh, increase in volume. The studies out there suggest that 90% of all data in human history has been created in the last two years. And so, so what really qualifies is big data when we say that. Is it a megabyte, a gigabyte, a terabyte, a petabyte, an exabyte? Well, a wise person here at Cyverse told me a few years ago that data are just data. Don't worry about the size of these things because there's always going to be more of them. And similarly with computing, we're seeing an exponential rate in the growth. And so there's the uh, ubiquitous Moore's Law figure. This is from Wikipedia. And this covers over 100 years. And you can see that uh, computing is continuously increasing in capacity. And, and just a, a point is that the last five of these computing advancements are now GPU. So we're moving beyond the CPU era into a new distributed computing uh, period. Okay, so I, I mentioned the research object. And you know, what is a research object? 
Well, broadly, it's, it's a way for identifying, aggregating, and exchanging scholarly information in a digital format. Uh, the, the research object website has this short quote, supporting the publication of more than just PDFs. So we're, we're moving beyond just the physical paper that you publish your science with, and they're making data, code, and other resources first-class citizens of scholarship. So that's to say that, that your code and your data are almost as important as the, the paper it is that you publish, but these things all need to be combined in, into a single thing, and that's what the research object is. And so in order to have a research object, you have to have a way of tracking it, which means it has a digital identifier number or an ORCID ID. It has annotation and provenance, so you know where this thing came from. And essentially what that means is it has metadata. And, and perhaps most important is that these data are discoverable and they're reusable. So the, the great part about Cybers is that we can cover that entire life cycle for the research object. So if you want to come in and create new data, you want to do your analysis on Cybers, you want to create metadata and annotate these things, and then finally move towards publication and archiving, we can cover that for you. When we think about the data science workbench, you know, we're, we're now calling ourselves data scientists. Maybe we, we used to be spatial analysts. Um, but we need a place to go and do this work virtually. And so what a data science workbench allows is for you to work in your preferred development environment with the computing language that you prefer and the software libraries that you need to get your, your analyses done. So you get to go and you can pick which tools you want to use. Um, and one of the things that we talk about a little bit is this computational notebook idea that you can, you can write your analysis in a, a reproducible notebook and you can do it in whatever language it is that you like. Some examples of popular data science software. Um, I'm going to spend some time today talking about Python, the project Jupyter. I'll talk a little bit about R and R Studio. And and now, um, just to give you guys a sense of, of what Cyvers is. Cyvers started in 2008 as the iPlant Collaborative. Uh, this was a, a five-year, $50 million project funded by the National Science Foundation to do cyber infrastructure for the plant sciences. Uh, and this, this coincided with the rise of next generation sequencing. And so uh, these scientists needed a place that they can go and assemble their genomes. Uh, Cyvers was, or excuse me, iPlant was renewed in 2013 by NSF. And by 2016, they rebranded and they changed their name to Cybers. And, and the reason they did this was that so many researchers had come in and started using iPlant. Um, it was hard for astronomers and physicists to go to their conferences and explain why they're using a, a platform called iPlant Collaborative, uh, when really it's just a cyber infrastructure. So our vision is that we're transforming science through data-driven discovery. And our mission is to design, deploy, and expand a national cyber infrastructure for the life sciences and to train scientists in its use, so the folks that are here today. So really, cybers is enabled by people and the research that they want to do. And our success depends upon new users coming into the system and developing new tools that, that other people can reuse. And an analogy to give is that we're not building a, a field of dreams, a cyber infrastructure out in the middle of nowhere and expecting people to show up and use it. The way that Cybers works are that scientists come to us with a problem and we talk to you and we develop a new workflow that's specific for your need and likely that is specific for many other users' needs. Uh, this guy here on the bottom right is Julian. He's one of our developers and he calls himself an organic software farmer. And so his job is to, to help you develop a unique tool set that we can, we can spread to the rest of the community. Okay, so what, what does Cybers really bring to offer you know, today's nouveau data scientists? Well, first we have a data store. And so this is an online uh, repository for new data that you upload. Every user that signs up for Cybers gets 100 gigabytes. If they'd like to increase their, their uh, allocation, they can write to us through our portal and we'll request, or we can approve those up to about 10 terabytes, but you need to have a good reason why you need those storage. If it's beyond 10 terabytes, we ask that you write a, a written proposal with uh, an explanation for why you need that space and what you're gonna do with it. 
uh, for the duration of your work. And then that will be reviewed by our executive team and approved likely. So despite uh, Cyverse hosting a multi-petabyte data store, we're not a canonical repository. And that means that we're not the place for you to dump your data and then leave it forever. Um, and there are other places like uh, S3 on AWS where large quantities of data, probably moving to the exabyte uh, scale, are, are being hosted and, and we're not one of those repositories. So what Cyverse is, is it's a place that you can bring your data for a short period of time, do your analyses on these data, pr produce even more result data, and then you know, we can allow you to hold that data on our data store for a short period, you know, six months to a couple of years, while you're working to move these accounts uh, or data into a, other private repositories or onto a canonical repository if there's such a thing for those types of data. Okay, so how do you move data onto an AHA? Excuse me. Cyber uses a system called iRODS, and iRODS is a multi-threaded file transfer that allows you to move data over the command line very quickly uh, through their I commands, and I'll give some examples of that in a moment. We have a graphic user interface uh, through our discovery environment, which allows you to see your data store, and you can also upload and download data through that. Uh, there are third-party applications like CyberDuck, uh, which I'll give a link to in a little bit, that you can use to connect to not just the data store, but also to things like Box and Google Drive. You can mount the data store on your local computer using a Fuse client. Uh, Fuse is, is okay for moving small files. It's not necessarily ideal for moving large quantities of data. And then for the developers, we have an Agave API, which I'll, I'll show a little bit later, which you can connect to the data store with. So if you want to use I commands, which is the iRODS format, uh, we can initiate a connection using an init command or an I init command. And, and it's using the same language as Linux. So instead of an ls command for listing a directory, you use ils to list your data store. If you want to create a new directory, instead of saying make directory, you say I make directory. And then if, if you want to move data off of the data store, you can use a get command, and this is specific to iRAS and I get. And in this example, I've got some flags, so I'm making sure that the data come and they're not corrupted. Um, getting feedback, there's a, a bulk flag there, a uh, recursive flag to go through an entire directory and pull all of the files, and then this verbose statement at the end. These are typical Linux commands if you're familiar with Linux. And then also you can push your data back up to the data store using an iput command. Um, and just to point out that these are all linked uh, back to our, our, uh, our wiki so that you can do these uh, on your own if you click on the presentation. So CyberDuck is a third party application that you can use to move files. It runs in uh, Windows or on a Mac and you can move your data on and off of our system in that way. Okay, Atmosphere is our cloud service. It's on-demand computing and it's set up for scientific research. We're running Linux, so you can use uh, instances that have either CentOS or Ubuntu. And, and one of the great things about Atmosphere is it allows users to collaborate together. So you can be in different places, working on the same instance uh, with the same data. And then also you can create your own in images uh, after you install your software and then relaunch those instances uh, much more quickly than having to compile the software each time. We have different flavors of instance size, and I'll, at the end of this demo, I'll, I'll show you some of those. Uh, we have small CPUs with four gigabytes of RAM, all the way up to uh, very large with 16 CPUs and 128 gigs. You can also create external volumes, uh, which you can attach to an individual instance. You can detach it and then move it to another instance if you like. And then we have an emulated web shell uh, running Apache Guacamole so that you can emulate a terminal through your browser, or you can also access uh, the, the instance through a, a desktop. So you can run an XFCE desktop, Linux, it looks just like a Windows desktop or a Mac desktop. So the Atmosphere was developed several years ago and it proved to be quite popular. And so uh, the, some folks went on and they developed the Jetstream platform, which is our research scale computing cloud, which allows users to use many more cores in a much larger environment. This is a schematic of the Jetstream platform. It's running both in uh, Indiana and in Texas. We have over 15,000 cores uh, that, that users can, can jump on and, and do their work with. Uh, Exceed is accessed, or excuse me, uh, Jetstream is accessed through the Exceed platform, which is uh, not Cyverse, 
Um, but Jetstream is running the atmosphere uh, on the, the front end. So the sizes of the instances on Jetstream are a little different. You can go from a, a small instance with only a couple of gigs of RAM all the way up to a very large instance. And I have a couple of those running right now, which I'll show you guys in a minute. Cybers has a data commons, and this is a place that you can go and you can uh, submit your data publicly and get a DOI for it. And so we use uh, the digital identifier number and the archival resource key, or the ARC, uh, and those are issued through the California Digital Library Service. Um, you can read more about uh, the data commons on the data commons website, but this is a place where you can publish data that doesn't necessarily have a canonical repository for it to live in. You can also publish your notebooks if you'd like. Um, and, and the great part about this is that you get a DOI with these, and then these data are searchable within the Cybers data store. The discovery environment is a workbench, and it's designed for you to add your own tools and then run analyses. Um, it has its own interface, which you can access the data store from. You can create workflows. Uh, so you, you install a tool, and then you can create apps from that tool. So for example, I have the um, Point Data Abstraction Library, or PDAL, or Poodle, installed on the discovery environment. And I can take individual um, apps from PDAL and run those as tool, or excuse me, take individual tools from PDAL and then run those uh, as apps on the DE. The way that you install your own tools on the discovery environment is that you create a Docker file, and I'm gonna spend some time talking about containers in a little bit, so for those that know what a Docker file is, you give us your Docker file, and we'll begin to uh, integrate that tool onto the discovery environment, and hopefully everything works, and at the end of it, you have your tool installed on our, our discovery environment. And there's a, a paper by my uh, colleague, Appendu Devasetti, which you can click on in this link, and you can read about how to get your tools installed on the discovery environment. We have a platform called BISC, and this is an image analysis platform. Uh, it's designed to do any type of imagery. So if you go into BISC today, you'll see that there are millions of images, and a lot of these are of um, micro slides, uh, uh, images of herbaria, but there's also new images that are uh, geospatial. So you can put in things like your drone imagery and, and go from there. What's, what BISC allows you to do is typical image analyses like segmentation, you can do annotations, and you can also tag these. This is a screenshot of BISC uh, that my colleague Blake Joyce did the other day. So we have an image from a drone flight that I did last year, and he's gone in and he's done a calibration using our, our ground control targets so that the image now has a scale. He does a segmentation so that we're, we're splitting out the, the green colors of the plants versus the, the ground, and then we're also getting a measurement of those uh, because he's given the image some, some scalar values. BISC is in development uh, right now. We're gonna be adding some machine learning capacity and hopefully launch some Dockerized versions of um, Structure for Motion, which I'll show you guys in a few minutes. Cybers has a learning center, which you can go and, and get started on. Uh, many of the tools that are in there are for genomics, um, but we'll be working on developing some more data science tools soon. For anyone that's interested, next week there's gonna be another webinar on getting started with Cybers, and it'll have uh, some more baseline examples of, of using the Cybers tools. Okay, so moving on and out. So for our power users, we have our Agave platform. And Agave is, is scalable in a way that, that a lot of these other tools aren't, but essentially what you can do is you can run the Agave to, to build large uh, workflows. You can attach to your Cybers data store or to Amazon. You can run these, these tools on the uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center, HPC Stampede, it's actually Stampede 2 now. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can, you can click on this link and, and learn more about some of those tools. Okay, moving on to containers. So the reason that we have containers is that when you develop in different operating systems using third-party software that have frequent updates um, and deployment issues, you, you run into what this uh, problem called dependency hell. And this is just a, a figure of, of a pretty well-known software, Mozilla Firefox, which I think most people would say runs fairly well. Um, and you can see that these are all the different dependencies within Firefox. And so if any one of those things breaks, then you're in trouble. So the solution that computer scientists have come up with is that if you want to compartmentalize and port these data, we need to containerize the software so that they can run anywhere. And so this started with things like virtual machine uh, running virtual hosts, 
and it's now moved on to these, these container software. And the, the container software that Cyverse uses uh, the most right now is Docker. The reason why you want to containerize is that you, know, you want to get away from these, these wicked problems of, of setting up your dependencies when you build a software stack. Um, compiling software from scratch is very slow, and if, if you're launching tens or hundreds of virtual machines a day or a week, you don't want to have to sit there and wait for these things to rebuild every time. And then also reproducibility of science can be hard. If you're developing a specific software, or excuse me, workflow, and you use different versions of software, you can often get different results. And so, and, and last, the portability of these containers, that you can run them essentially anywhere. Uh, there's another container software I'm going to talk about today, which is called Singularity. And Singularity is set up to run on an HPC system. It's a little bit different than Docker in that it uses uh, more of the host environment. And part of the benefit of this, it allows you to see all the mounted volumes on the environment without having to specifically uh, give the container a volume. Um, it also has root privileges. So if you want to run on a high performance computing system where you don't necessarily have uh, ownership, you can now install your tools inside of your Singularity container on HPC. Uh, Singularity plays very well with Docker, so you can, you can use a Docker file to build a Singularity container. For anyone who's interested in learning more about containers, uh, Cyverse will be hosting a workshop in Tucson at the end of next winter. Uh, at the moment, we're targeting some uh, dates uh, in late February, but those exact dates will be announced soon, and you can contact Cyverse if you're interested in attending that. Okay, we're finally getting to GIS. So hopefully you guys have hung on long enough. So the majority of data, not just uh, any kind of spatial data, but all data are, are spatial or themselves have a spatial component. I think we all are aware of, of ESRI. Um, they're the most common GIS that users first encounter. And they dominate the marketplace, at least in the United States. Um, and they're, they're used widely by the government and in academia. And so if you're looking to get a job in the government, you're probably learning how to work with uh, ESRI software. But we also have open source software. And an example I'll give is the Geographic Resource Analysis Support System, or what we call GRASS, uh, which was first developed in 1982 by the Army Corps of Engineers. GRASS has also been in continuous development for the last 35 or so years. And GRASS is, is now part of the Open Source Geospatial Foundation. And so OSGEO contains numerous different software platforms like GDAL um, and Saga, and these are tools that people can use. So the, the open source community has really grown up probably just in the last five or 10 years that I've noticed. Um, and so you have new open source tools like QGIS, which are built on top of uh, the OSGEO uh, tool sets. And you have enterprise solutions like Boundless, who have taken uh, QGIS and also PostGIS, and which is built on top of Postgres, and they're offering a suite of tools which you can use to run your servers uh, doing open source tools. So this kind of question that I'm afraid I'll get asked is which platform is best for you to use on Cybers? And I'll just say that they're all great. There's lots of different uh, things that people need to do to get things done, and there's no one toolkit that's going to really get you to the end. So this issue of, of using licensed software uh, on the cloud, and specifically on cybers. So ArcGIS is used all over the place. Um, up to 40% of users out there are using ArcGIS, and ArcGIS requires a license. So the new ArcGIS Portal 10.5 uh, can run in Linux. So you can install um, a portal on Cyverse Atmosphere or Jetstream if you choose. Um, I wouldn't say that that's an ideal situation because Portal is meant to run on a server permanently, and most of these, these virtual instances are ephemeral. So you, you set them up, you run them, and then you turn them off when you're done. Um, but what you can do is it, you can bring your own license keys, and you can, you can run these things on environments that you need to. The example that I'm going to give in a few minutes is running the ArcGIS uh, IPython or Jupyter Notebooks uh, using Docker on an Atmosphere instance. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a short video uh, for the demo, but um, this idea about building your first virtual machine, um, I'm not sure how many of you saw the movie The Edge of Tomorrow, but this is kind of the feeling I have when I'm working with, with VMs. This is the first time I set up a VM, it's, it's not necessarily ideal, 
and I land up having to kill it and start over again. And so over time, I find that I've gotten a lot better at running these things. And so I think your experience might be similar that, you know, you might be frustrated the first time, but by the end, you're going to be doing some amazing things. So to set up a, a VM as a data science workbench, the first thing you need to do is create a new instance on our Atmosphere platform, or if you've gotten access to Exceed and Jetstream. Um, if you want to create your own image of this instance, you want to do a small size possible, and that's because once the instance is imaged, you can launch larger size instances, but not smaller. Um, and then you want to make sure that you install your software into either the opt or the serve directories, uh, rather than in your home directory, because when you image an instance, the, the user-specific directories like home are, are blown away. So what we've done is, is created an easy installation set of tools for new users. So um, easy is running an Ansible playbook, which you don't really get to see, and I'm not gonna explain Ansible today. Um, but essentially, you come into the virtual machine running a, a web shell, or if you wanna open and, and connect to the machine through SSH terminal, you can type in easy, and what you'll see is a list of, of commands. And so we have easy D, if you'd like to install Docker, easy S, if you'd like to install Singularity, or easy J, if you'd like to install Jupyter Notebook. And you can also add some additional flags if you want to install different kernels with Jupyter. So you can install, in this example, the R kernel, and you're going to install Python 3 kernel. In this first demo example, I've got a video that I've set up on YouTube, and I'm going to hope that it works. Um, but the, the simple steps that I take are after the instance is active, I do EZD. I add myself to the Docker group so that I don't have to use a pseudo privilege. Uh, if I want to run Docker without being in the Docker group, I have to use the pseudo command before Docker. And you'll see an example of how that errors out. I'll exit the terminal and it'll automatically restart. I'm going to pull a container from a group called Rocker, who's developed a Docker container for RStudio that has an entire suite of geospatial tools. And then once the container's pulled, I can run it. And I'm going to run it in a detached state, uh, accessing it over port 8787. Okay, so let's run the video and hope it works. Okay, so right now, you're going to see me logging into the Cyverse atmosphere through my authentication. This is the initial landing page with my dashboard. And you can see I, I've used a certain amount of allocation. Um, and there's the different instances I've launched. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new project here in the project folder. I'll give it a name. And I have to go to description. The description can be short or it can also be long. Um, some people would like to write their entire paper in there and that's just fine. I go into this new project and I'm gonna select an instance. In this example, I'm gonna use one of our featured instances uh, using a graphic user interface. So this is the newest version of Ubuntu, long-term release. I'm gonna launch it on our, our Marana provider. You can see the different sizes of instance with uh, variable amounts of CPU, RAM, and storage. And then I'm gonna go ahead and launch it. And I've, I've compressed time a bit here to, to uh, save us a little bit of waiting. But this launches in about seven minutes. This video has been condensed down to five minutes. While the instance is spinning up, I'm gonna uh, create an external volume, which I want to attach to this instance. So you can see we have two different providers in this case. I'm gonna select the Marana Cloud, give it a 100 gigabyte volume size. And you can see that in my allocation, I have up to, to four terabytes of space. Okay, a few seconds later, that volume has now been created. I'm gonna go ahead and attach that volume once the instance is active. So you can see the instance is, is still going through its, its spin up. It finally reaches an active state, at which point I'm able to attach an instance and I can also begin to interact with this, this VM. So I can click a button and then, because I only have a single VM in this project, I know that it's okay to click on that and it is gonna attach to the instance. Now once the instance is active and I have this attachment, I can scroll down and on the right you can see I have different links for running web shell or web desktop. Uh, the instance has an IP address also that's presented. So in this example, I've clicked on the web desktop. And so now I'm running the XFCE 
you can see when you first start the instance, it, it comes up with a default resolution, which isn't necessarily very high quality. By using the xrander command, I can see the different available sizes of desktop. And I've selected a, a HD 1080p resolution at this point. And so now I'm, I'm in the instance and I'm running it. We have a, a Kanky client, which can connect to our data store. You can see if I try to connect to it uh, for the first time, it, it errors. And that's because I haven't authenticated um, through to my data store yet. So by typing the init command for i commands, and then using my Cybers password, I can connect to the data store. So if I go back and I, I click on the connect to irods again, you can see that I'm now connected to my data store. Go ahead and close that window and open the web shell now. So this is a, an emulated terminal. And then you see it's command line. If I type in the EZ command and hit enter, you can see I get a help menu and it suggests that I need to select either EZJ or EZD. I go ahead and collect or select EZD. I have to enter in my Cyverse password. And now it's building Docker for me. So now Docker's installed. If I try to run it without sudo, it errors. So I can, I can run it with sudo and you see it works. If I do this uh, user mod to add myself to the group, I can exit out and then restart. And if I run Docker without sudo, now it works. So now I'm ready to run the RStudio Docker container in a detached state. So I'm selecting Rocker Geospatial. This is compressed a little bit. It doesn't quite move that fast, but it will someday, hopefully. So I install the container, and now the container is running on the virtual machine. So I can go back to the page and copy the IP address, open a new browser tab, and then give it the 8787 port, and you can see it, I'm ready to log into RStudio. This particular instance uses an RStudio password. And so now I'm running RStudio server, and for anyone that's used RStudio before, RStudio server is identical, except you'll notice that I'm running it in a browser. So by running the Rocker geospatial container, I've, I've just pulled an entire set of libraries that are uh, GIS specific, and we're all ready to go. can create a R Markdown notebook. And now I'm ready to start developing my, my analysis. Okay, so that concludes that video. Let's get past the video. Okay, so this next example uh, is installing uh, Anaconda and Jupyter natively without a Docker container. So if I type EZJ and I go to force command for Python 3, I can install the notebook and it'll start running. Um, just a note that if, if you do want to add additional kernels to the Anaconda installation, you'll have to give yourself ownership. And you can do that in the VM by, by using the sudo command and changing the ownership of the home directory where Anaconda self-installs, and then you'll be ready to go there. And just to show you, I have, this is actually a, an active VM that I'm running right now, and I'm running QGIS. So just to give another xrander, let's see, I'll go xrander s 20 by 1080. Okay, so, so here's the VM. And I'm actually running, in this particular VM, I've pre-installed QGIS. And this was installed using a shell script, which is in the GitHub repo uh, for this presentation. And so here you can see I have QGIS running. The, the guacamole shell is pretty fast. Um, there's, there's a low latency, so I'm able to, to see things fairly quickly. And as I say that, it takes a while to load. Okay, it looks like it's stuck for a second, but I'm gonna come over here, oops. Okay, so one thing that happens is that if, if I don't have activity, it'll disconnect me, but it's not killing the instance at all, it's just disconnecting my browser. So I can reconnect the browser. Okay, maybe it got angry when it was, it was loading in these, these GIS layers. Okay, so the, the EZJ command, uh, so I've run it here. 
I have a notebook that's running. Let's see, which one is the notebook? Well, maybe I don't have a particular notebook running right now. Okay, so I can run the notebook and once I run the notebook, it becomes active. So we'll just come back here for a second and we'll go through to this next example. So this, this example, I'm running the ArcGIS uh, Jupyter Notebook. So I've done the Docker installation, added myself to the group, and then I'm, I'm running the, the ESRI Docker container. And so I've done that in this example here. And so you can see that, that once, once the container finishes pulling, it activates the notebook. And so it gives me a URL, which I copied and I inserted here. Um, and then I gave it the IP address of the VM. And so now I'm, I'm running this, this notebook. So this particular instance, I'm running uh, in tandem with my ArcGIS online. So you can see here in the notebook, I've, I've given it my authentic authentication information and it's logged me in. Um, the, the ESRI Jupyter Notebook has uh, dozens of, of different pre-built notebooks for, for you to explore for the first time on your own. So you can come in here and just and pick one. And you can see that these are automatically opening. And this is all running on a medium size instance that I'm, I've built on Atmosphere. So I think those are, actually it's a small instance right here. So these are, these are the five instances that I have running. This QJS one is the one that I've got the, the notebook open for at the moment. Okay. Okay, so one question I'm sure some people have is, is what about connecting to other types of file systems? So perhaps you have data running on uh, Google Drive or maybe on Amazon. So you can connect your VM to uh, your Google Drive account by using Fuse clients like this OCaml Fuse. You can use a, a Google Drive client written in the Go language. This is similar to a command line uh, situation like we have with our I commands. And so I have links to these if you'd like to, to explore those. Okay, um, this is where things are gonna get pretty cool, but also maybe kind of crazy. So for those folks that are interested in really scaling out their analyses using Cybers, you can start thinking about doing multi-container jobs using our Atmosphere or even HPC. Cybers uses, or excuse me, at least I use uh, a system called Makeflow, which is developed by the Collaborative Computing Lab. Uh, in the CC tools environment. And so these are some examples from the CC tools webpage of, of running small jobs and then scaling out to, to tens to hundreds to thousands of, of cores. And so just to give you a, an idea about how all of this works, uh, I have a repo, which I'm running on, on the Cybers JS page, where I have a singularity container I've built with the OSGO software suite. So I've compiled from source uh, Grass and GDAL, and I also have the CC tools built inside of this container. I also have a set of uh, basic shell scripts and Python scripts, which call Makeflow to begin running jobs. And then they begin uh, pulling a new container from uh, the Singularity Hub or from uh, this particular instance I'm running off of uh, Open Science Grid, an HPC system, and I start running masters and workers. Uh, we've also built in a uh, a web shell for running uh, a VM that connects to open topography for the, the final deployment of this tool. So just a, another diagram, the spaghetti diagram. Uh, so I have my first container which I can launch on my local workstation. I can run on a, an uh, extra large cloud instance like I'll show in a moment, or I can even run on a, an HPC. So this, this set here is running a worker which is the same container as the master. And that pulls from the Singularity Hub and installs on that remote computer. I can also run the same container on my local host or on a cloud instance, which I'm gonna do for you guys. And then these two are gonna to talk to each other as the master and worker and distribute jobs until the, the entire workflow is completed. I can pull data from any uh, source on the internet. So if I wanna pull things from Open Topography or, or S3, or even just from the local machine. And then those output data can write to wherever I tell them. So I can put them back onto the VM or I can move them onto the Cybers data store. Okay, so let's, let's try this. 
Okay, so, so in this example, just see which VM this is. Okay, so this is this is a, a 44 core machine on Jetstream with 120 gigs of RAM. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell it to run a worker. And so this worker, which I've pulled from my, my uh, GitHub repository, is now pulling a container and starting to run on the, the worker node. If I come back to my master node, you can see I've, I've pulled the same container, I've installed Singularity, I've given it a, a password so that these two workers and masters can authenticate to each other. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna initiate the master. And so I'm gonna hit go here, and what it's gonna do is start pulling that container and hopefully start running in, in a few moments. So I'm gonna take a break from this because it's gonna take a while to get started. Let's go ahead and open, try opening another web shell. And at this point in the presentation, I'm, I'm basically done. Um, we're just gonna let this, this example run and maybe we can take a look at it um, after it finishes. So maybe with that, Tina, um, we can open it up for some questions. There was a question, Tyson, and the question was, does a new user, this is in regard to when you were talking about the data store and available storage, uh, does a new user have to be a, a .edu account holder or is this open to anyone? Did you get that? Tyson? Okay, Tina, are you there? Uh, okay, I'm gonna take a look at some of the chat. Right, so there had been a question about needing an EDU account to, uh, to have access to 100 gigabyte default data storage. Okay, it looks like there's, there's only one question so far from, from Eric Linger. Uh, can Globus be used with Cybers for large data movement? Yeah, absolutely. There's another question about the, the EDU account holder. Did you get that? Tyson. <laughs> All right, Alicia, I think he might have his volume turned down since there's so much going on on his screen too. Um, let me try and just type in something. Nirav has written, Nirav Merchant is one of our co-PIs, and he says there's no need for an EDU um, account in order to access the default storage of 100 gigabytes. And... Okay, looks like I, I turned my volume off, so sorry. <laughs> okay. So there's really just the two questions, and, and Nirav's answered one, and then the question about Globus, did you want to expound on that? Um, you know, I, I don't use Globus myself. Um, maybe Nirav can answer that, but as far as I know, you can, you can use Globus, no problem. All right. uh, okay, so there's, there's a question from Jan. So if I plan to run my C code on Cyverse, do I need to compile the code before I run it on Cyverse? Uh, also, does Cyverse provide commonly used C libraries for image processing such as HDF and NetCDF? Um, so yeah, so if, if you wanted to run your C code um, on Cybers in a container, you would need to, to pre-build it. If you're running it on a virtual machine, then you would just log into your virtual machine and do your work. Um, and then using uh, the libraries like uh, HDF, NetCDF, yeah, those, those can run um, in a container. Um, if you wanted to do something specific on the discovery environment, then, then we could do that. Um, can everyone still see my screen? 
Is it still shared? Yes, it's still shared. Okay, so the container is running. Um, let's see, I gotta find the, okay, so here's, here's that extra large instance, and you can see it's clocking all of the cores at this moment because the, the workflow is, is running like 370 something jobs. Um, each job is using four cores at a time. Um, I'm running a, an MP version of our sun and grass. And so this, this example is a small uh, digital elevation model. And you can see I'm able to run through an entire year of solar radiation in just a few moments um, with this distributed process. And so I, I run this mostly on HPC, but the Makeflow can run also, as you can see, across uh, individual containers on two virtual machines. And um, I guess maybe before we run out of time, I'll just say that for anyone that, that doesn't know where to get started, a good place is to go to the Carpentries. Um, and this is Software Carpentry and Data Carpentry. And then Cybers also has a learning center. And then I'll, I'll just put up this last slide for everyone to see. Tyson, there's one other question. Uh, are there examples of using a dockerized web server to run a Flask server to create like persistent web API services? How does that play with my Cybers allocation? So if, if you wanted to run a, a dockerized web service over Atmosphere, you would need to have enough allocation per month to, to leave that instance on. Um, as far as running this over the discovery environment, I'm not sure if we can do that, but we could, we could take a look at it. Um, what, one point to make is that, that Atmosphere is, is not intended to be a website um, for you to, to run your services permanently. These virtual machines are, like I said, they're somewhat ephemeral, so you, you turn them on, you run them, and you get your analysis done, you turn them off. Um, but that said, if you got an allocation on Exceed uh, with Jetstream, you could, you could definitely run that API service um, for an entire year. The startup allocations on uh, Exceed for Jetstream are usually around 50,000 hours. So I believe uh, 51,000 hours per year would be like a six core VM running nonstop for an entire year. Okay. And Nirav has put some more information in the chat notes on some of the questions as well. Are there any other questions for Tyson? Otherwise, um, if there aren't, let's see. Okay. Uh, if there aren't any further questions, um, and Tyson has left you his contact information up at the top part of the um, the webinar, and maybe Tyson, you can put it in chat as well. But Thank you for attending today's webinar and our next webinar, which we are planning our lineup for the spring. But the next one in January will be on PsyApps, uh, which is a feature at Cyverse that allows you to build and share reproducible bioinformatics workflows using Cyverse. So stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, thank you very much to Tyson and for everybody for attending. Again, um, I will send you an email with the uh, a uh, link to the wiki page where all this material will be posted uh, later on today or first thing next week. And uh, it will also have a link to a survey to give us feedback. Thank you, and everybody. For anyone that's still online, uh, you can also access this uh, GitHub repo to cybers gis All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Catch you next time. All right, bye everyone. Thank you for attending.